Hey guys, Montel here, and thanks so much for tuning in to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And I am so excited about the show today because I have a guest on who literally understands that one of the most important aspects of this entire cannabis journey in America is the, uh, uh, is the aspect of education. I mean, education, 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 education. It's as important to this whole movement as, you know, location, location, location is to a real estate agent. Yet it seems like some of the industry has kind of left that behind, thinking that it's more important to just, you know, educate us on B2B issues rather than B2C issues so that the consumer understands what they are trying to achieve when they reach out and attempt to use cannabis to for whatever their reason may be, whether it be, you know, for personal use, whether it be for medical use. And I think like you've heard me say a million times, and I'll say it again. I don't believe that anybody enters a space of cannabis without some sort of underlying medical reason behind it. They may not even be aware of it themselves. They may not even want to recognize it as a medical reason themselves, but even if it's to the point of just relaxing or it's the point of, you know, trying to expand, you know, their consciousness, that is in me, in my uh, point of view, is medical in some way. So, you know, I've taken exception to the fact that we try too hard to differentiate between what we're calling adult use or some people call recreational use and medical use. I think it's all one and the same. There are some people who just need a little bit more medicine. You know, I mean, I, I liken it to the idea of, you know, uh, there is regular Tylenol and there's extra strength Tylenol. There is, uh, you know, regular Advil and there's extra strength Advil. There are you know, ways that you can, you know, uh, suppress a migraine just by using oxygen. Some people have found that to be a really, really, really powerful tool. Others, you know, suppress it by using harder drugs. Um, so again, I think though, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is achieve some sort of a state that makes us feel better than we did before we started. And to me, that's medicine. So for, you know, the average consumer out there who is trying their best to navigate this really almost impossible format for which we are selling cannabis right now today, uh, especially based on so much misinformation. It's good to know that there's somebody out there like my guest today who is really, you know, let's call him a sommelier of cannabis. He's a co-founder and president of the Tricome Institute, a cannabis-based education company where he is an explorer and a lover of all things nature and all things that nature has to offer. Uh, Max uh, Montrose, please welcome. Thank you so much for being a part of Let's Be Blunt with Montel today, sir. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. I'm excited to have you too, because, you know, it's, it's, it's important that people understand, you know, the nuance in cannabis and not just, you know, what seems to be, you know, especially being portrayed by the industry, you know, what they think the underlying reasons are for cannabis. So I'm glad that you're doing it. So let's let's back up a little bit. Let's take why don't you take us on your journey with cannabis? When did your journey with cannabis start? You know, my, um, I was self-medicating uh, without really realizing it when I was really young. Um, and I actually exchanged cannabis for pharmaceuticals uh, for pain, uh, for paying attention, anxiety, sleep, all sorts of things. But um, something that you might find interesting is my very first medical marijuana patient that I was uh, licensed to take care of in Colorado uh, was a gentleman with MS. And mm. he would walk into the dispensary um, uh, in not <laughs> your kind of normal format. I mean, you could tell this guy was hurting in, in a variety of different ways. And what actually kind of inspired me to create the Trichome Institute was how he was being treated in the dispensary. And that's actually why I, I uh, took it upon myself to take care of him personally, because I was just so disappointed um, in the industry. And this is back in 2009. So this is before cannabis regulation. This is before uh, legalization in Colorado. This was a while ago. Um, this was before we had childproof packaging or even lap testing, okay? Um, and, you know, I was told to stop talking to this guy. Stop telling him all these things. Stop giving him all this information. Just sell him a sack of weed and move on. And that was difficult for me to do because I was a medical marijuana patient myself and this guy needed help. 
And he wasn't getting it at the time. And he wasn't getting it from the ideology of it's either Indica or Sativa, when obviously it's neither. Um, and he had a really interesting need for cannabis that uh, seemingly only I could understand, which was um, how to be sure that he was going to get a stimulating varietal and not a sedative varietal. And for whatever reason, his MS required the uh, what we call NLM, the narrow leaf marijuana type. Um, that's what he needed. And strain names couldn't get him there. You couldn't just trust that this blue dream would be a stimulant when there's so many types of blue dream because uh, it's a black market product. There's not consistency in the naming. And so um, it was almost kind of the inspiration that started the cannabis uh, sommelier uh, in Turpany. And so we use the same methodology that I was using uh, 12 years ago, teaching patients in the dispensary that now we've created into a full-blown course, uh, multi-level course with books, tools, um, all sorts of really interesting stuff to explain the complexity of cannabis, the most dynamic drug on the planet. Without a doubt. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm glad that you, you gave a little bit of a history. I mean, but you started using yourself, not, I will again, not say recreationally, but you started using in the black market at, in high school, before high school, junior high school, when? Yeah. Um, actually, believe it or not, uh, if I'm being honest with you, I actually first started uh, using in middle school. Um, and I'll, uh, I also think that that's probably too young for most people to start with cannabis. Um, you know, I was exposed to really poor quality cannabis uh, at a young age called Schwag. And um, I started learning more and more about cannabis, finding different unique variety types that affected me in different ways and really started um, analyzing how and why which varieties would affect me in certain ways. And that's actually what kind of transformed me from smoking cannabis just for fun into, hey, this is a medicine. This is helping me sleep. This is helping me pay attention in school. Uh, this stuff is helping me, <laughs> but it's dynamic. And so to better understand a complex and dynamic substance such as cannabis um, has been my life's mission. And I really love sharing uh, the, the depth that we've discovered with it um, because when you can control your own cannabis um, experience the way that interpreting helps people do, you're in more control. You can get more medicine out of it because you take all the guessing out, the guessing that's required with the industry standards, strain names, indica, sativa, THC percentages. We just take out all of those equations because those those things don't really make sense. Right. They don't really matter. Again, this is part of the problem, I think, that's been in this industry for a long time. Like you, you know, I started my journey, my real journey with cannabis back in 2000. So, you know, when I was first diagnosed with MS, there was no information. And so I had to dig deep and I had to try myself but back in 2000, digging where there was no way. Remember, there was no Internet. So you're looking for you know, copies of peer-reviewed published documents from around the world that were hard to get a hold of, hard to find, hard to, to interpret. Uh, but I was able to get a lot of information really back in 2000, long like yourself, long before this became the Vogue, you know, green rush and you know, everybody decided to jump aboard and really only stick their toes in, but don't stick their whole foot in. And I learned very early on that, you know, all the nomenclature that was being used in, a lot of the dispensaries, especially in California at the time, because that was probably the only place that you could literally go up in northern, uh, you know, in San Francisco and Oakland Bay Area to find a dispensary that actually could sell legally. You know, um, I remember my first journey uh, out there trying to look for what this doctor said. I, I heard about this kind of cannabis, uh, this kind of marijuana, the CB something, C something. I don't know what it is. And I remember going up in northern California and literally asking a question about higher laden CBD plants and literally had a grower and a person who owns, you know, owned one of the top stores in the Oakland Bay, in the Bay area, um, say, look, I got this cannabis that came up. It's way high in CBD and I don't want it. If you want it, I'll give you all of it. And I was like, are you kidding me? It's again, back before people even understood what you were talking about when you were talking about, 
you know, just cannabinoids. And then, and then now all of a sudden we're in a place now where people are starting to understand that the terpenes the flavonoids, the fats, lipids, all of that is just as important to is one of the constituents of the plants are just as important. You know, people are now starting to get it at least, at least opening up their mind to a better interpretation. What did you study in college? Uh, sociology, just because um, I I had to make my Jewish parents happy by going to college, but I didn't want to because <laughs> I uh, I knew I was going to have a different path. But um, you know, sociology is important because there's nothing in the world that you can engage in outside of nature itself without um, involving people, and so learning about people and their cultures was important for me. Um, and, you know, I started uh, my, the college I went to was a, a conservative Catholic school where I was um, dispensing cannabis across the street. Uh, and again, before regulation. So we were smoking in the dispensary. So I'd come to class every day uh, soaking in it, <laughs> which was uh, quite the experience. But um, have you ever good seen advertising, a good advertising board, too? Right? Have you ever seen a weed wheel? Uh, I've seen a, a variant of it. So. Instead of saying indica or sativa, instead of having THC or CBD percentages, uh, which do matter, but we have a this process where um, if you need to know how to find a type of cannabis that affects you in certain ways, cannabis is on a spectrum from five effect types that you can actually smell for in different parts of your face. And so... Um, if we had a broadleaf marijuana varietal that you would smell certain smells with certain uh, inflorescence characteristics, that you actually feel the vibrations of the terpenes, whether they're stimulating or sedative within their totality, you can actually sense within the trigeminal nerve of your face. And so if we go down to a broadleaf marijuana type, people can understand that in a physical perspective, you might get couch lock. Mentally, it's comfortable. Your focus is zoned out. Your mood is carefree. The risk is no productivity. The activity is sleep or lounge. And how much that will affect you is going to depend on your personal tolerance level as well. And so um, I just wanted to share with you that this is kind of our solution for getting around strain names, Indicor Sativa, and even THC percentages. Because like you mentioned, we're discovering that the terpenes have a lot more to do with how cannabis affects people from the effect type perspective, um, maybe a little bit more so than some of your more um, better known cannabinoids. Yeah, well, you know, and I think we, right, when you say better known cannabinoids, we're barely scratching the surface on cannabinoids right now. We understand and know that there's peer, there's peer reviewed, uh, you know, published documents around the world from Canada and from Israel and from, you know, now Colombia and other places around the world that, that there's some people claiming that they've identified up to 160 cannabinoids. And so therefore we haven't done the research on all those yet. Most people in America right now are just now starting to understand there's something called CBG. They didn't even know what that was. You know, most people didn't know that there was CBN. They don't know what that is. They don't know what CBD that really does. They don't really understand the difference between THC, CBD, CN. You know, it, it's gotten to the point where, you know, we have a lot of people who just like to throw out a lot of nomenclature uh, to sound as if they know what they're talking about, but not necessarily understand it and interpret it the right way. I mean, you described yourself as a naturalistic learner, and that's based on the fact that you were, you know, studied. I guess I, I use it as that term, studied. But you, you were, you went to a lot of private schools when you were growing up, did you not? Yeah, I did. Um, I graduated from a public school, uh, George Washington. Um, but uh, due to my learning uh, differences, my uh, really severe ADD, dyslexia, psychomotor agitation, um, I did go to private schools that were um, helpful for me for that kind of stuff. Uh, and so it, that's kind of now, again, at the same time as you're going to private, these, these private facilities that are trying to determine, help you figure out what was going on, you were still using cannabis, right? Um, that was around the time that I was really juggling Adderall for cannabis. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Adderall uh, is an amphetamine salt. Ritalin is methylphenidate. And when you're a kid and you're given these substances, they're not to medicate a debilitating condition. 
It's for scholastic performance enhancement. And most people don't know that. And the result when you give a child a supplement that is amphetamine based or meth based, uh, like Adderall and Ritalin is, the side effects are you can't eat, you can't sleep, and you have a really nasty mood. You can, you can be triggered very easily. Um, there's chemical reasons for that. Whereas some of these really interesting varietals that I was using when I was young, um, Island Sweet Skunk, uh, Golden Goat, these really uh, more pure narrow leaf uh, types, they helped me focus the same way that Adderall would, but their side effects were I could eat, I could sleep, and I was generally in a good mood. And so I made that decision on my own when I was a kid um, that I have something here to help me. And it it's more helpful to me than the stuff that society thinks I should be taking. And so even though society thinks that cannabis is wrong, I know that it's right. Um, so I'm going to use it. And I did. Well, well, I, I think when you say the society, I think that we're just looking at one society, and that's mostly in the United States that yeah. you know decided to attack this plant not for any reasons other than racist, you know, uh, uh, non uh, just racist financial reasons. Um, so you know, the I, I, attack. I, what's that? I was going to say, you know, um, uh, the the means in which um, they were so effective in their propaganda campaign against cannabis was racism. Without a doubt. Um, it was, without I mean, a doubt. It, without what, a doubt. What, what the people, people don't understand. You know, if we look back in 1937, people don't even understand it. The person who led the charge was the Anslinger, you know, who was funded by William Randolph Hearst and Charles DuPont. This was done intentionally to help continue to propagate the destruction of the big trees in America and also to shift over to textiles. People don't get that. And then the only way you could do that was to blame this thing on somebody. So you had to blame it. That's the reason why they came up with the word marijuana, marijuana based on a Mexican prostitute term. So, you know, it, I, I, people, do, you mind if I, do you mind if I um, teach you a couple things? Sure. So um, uh, we agree that the, uh, the, methodology, the methodology in which they were successful in their propaganda campaign against cannabis was racism. Um, and uh, I've actually trained William Randolph Hearst's granddaughter. She's an interpreting certified person uh, who I'm friends with. And um, a lot of people don't understand that it was really more for financial reasons, that cannabis threatened oil, big oil. That's right. Um, it Henry Ford was not only developing biodegradable cars out of cannabis, but running them on cannabis oil. And DuPont uh, Chemicals, William Randolph right. Hearst, paper, who lost uh, to uh, Pancho Villa, a Mexican, and who was you know, a hemp propagator, which combated with paper, but also um, tobacco, alcohol, and pharmaceuticals. Cannabis threatens all of the major big ones, right? Big tobacco, big pharma, big, <laughs> big alcohol. Um, and a lot of people believe that the word marijuana was created um, for these racist purposes. And it wasn't created for these racist purposes. It was used for these racist purposes primarily only between 1920 and 1940. But what a lot of people don't know is the 500-year-old etymology of the word marijuana, which derives, um, which you can find in the 1846 Pharmacopoeia Mexicana, Mexicana Pharmacopoeia, um, which actually shows you the etymology, which is so interesting that um, when the Spanish Inquisition took away uh, indigenous religious plant types, entheogens, to native um, Mexicans, that they actually introduced cannabis and told them to grow it for hemp purposes because they the Spanish needed it for uh, canvas, canvas for their sails, right. for their boats, for Correct. their rope. Yeah, and, we go way back. Well, remember this country here in the United States back at the founding fathers in the in the original thirteen states. You were required to grow hemp. You know, all of our forefathers grew hemp. When we recently, you know, scraped the uh, the pipe of Benjamin Franklin's that had been sitting on his desk for 30 years at the Smithsonian Institute, they scraped it out and realized that Benjamin Franklin was smoking some hemp. He wasn't just smoking tobacco. Homeboy was getting the buzz every day if he wanted to. So, most, yeah. likely, most likely Jesus too, because if you actually Correct. look at 
if you look in the Torah, uh, the recipe for the anointing oil requires cannabosum, which we know is cannabis. And that was just uh, corroborated by scientists who discovered the cannabinoids uh, in the old altars of the old temples in Jerusalem very recently. I've, I've been talking about that for years, and I always made <laughs> the statement, if it was good enough for Jesus, why isn't it good enough for me? Um, the the word marijuana that I wanted to tell you, though, was the, the indigenous people tricked the Spanish Inquisition by saying that they've now named the cannabis plant, which they started using for entheogenic purposes when they weren't legally allowed to, as the plant of Mother Mary. This is Christ's mom's plant. This is mariguana, Santa Maria. And the word marijuana is a derivative of calling the plant something to relate it to Christianity, to allow the Christian Inquisition to allow the native and indigenous people to actually keep cannabis during their cannabis prohibition, which is why uh, viva la palabra marijuana, right? Like long live the word marijuana for the Mexican people and their indigenous terminology that they used it for and how shameful it was that a lot of white guys in the 1930s tried to flip that around and they were successful at it. Um, but still to this day in Mexico, the word marijuana is not a bad word. And um, it's, it's, it's actually a really interesting, it has a really interesting history. And so um, we've been more open-minded to the word marijuana, but I'll be honest, I told people for over 10 years, you're not even allowed to say the M word because I thought the word in and of itself was racist until I decided maybe that's me perpetuating racism instead of right. allowing the beauty of the word to be what it is and to embrace it and its, and its indigenous history. It's a 500-year-old indigenous Mexican word. It's so and when, awesome. And when, when you look at the fact that, you know, uh, Anslinger, who was during prohibition for alcohol, was in favor of cannabis use. A lot of people don't know that. They think that he always, did. but when he lost his job, when they decided to go ahead and bring alcohol back and allow that to be used, all of a sudden, hope we had to find something else that he could attack. And he jumped on that bandwagon and, you know, for the rest of his life, didn't, and tried his best to do everything he could to outlaw hemp around the world. Hence, you know, the 62, 61, no, 62 UN treaty that banned hemp. Yeah. Uh, 1972 CSA Act, Controlled Substance Act. Uh, that was in the United States. Nixon. Yeah, in the States, right. Yeah. But it was in 61, 62 that it was banned by the UN? I know that the Controlled Substance Act of 1972, which was Nixon, uh, which again was actually used for more racist reasons than not, it was to break up the brown black and white people who were coming together in the 1960s against uh, Nixon, his administration in the war. It was hippies. And we know from his tapes, you can literally hear him in the Oval Office say, uh, how are we going to combat these, these, these people that are coming together? Um, and it was to bust them over cannabis. And it was to make cannabis uh, enemy number one, which is, you know, how shameful is it that still to this day, federally, cannabis is schedule one, which means it provides no medical benefit, <laughs> has the highest potential for addiction and the highest potential for overdose death even though the U.S. government has recognized medical marijuana and has pharmaceutically been producing it longer than I've been alive. Uh, right, for like the last 50 years, uh, 50 years plus, 50 years in Mississippi. You know, that first program that was started under Daddy Bush. You're right. So a lot of people don't recognize, don't take the time. And again, that's what's so important about the what we're talking about is that education, education, education. The more knowledge we have, you know, the better we are suited to be able to understand why this should be available to anyone in this country who needs it. Yeah. Now, you you literally, you know, have a, a kind of, uh, let's go back a little bit again, because I want to kind of start with where you made that transition. Was it when you got out of college that you decided I'm going to go ahead and open up the university or? Well, no. Well, high, high school is when I, high school is when I said enough with pharmaceuticals, it's cannabis. And it was high school when I became an activist. Um, and I've got some wild activism stories. Um, and I guess in high school, you were, you were a sign carrying, you know, cannabis yeah. activist, were you not? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, when Fox News, um, Fox News got me stoned on, on TV and put me through what a year was this? What year was this? What year was this? Well, I mean, listen, I started marching in the street with signs in 2006, 2007. 
uh, with actually the guys who legalized cannabis um, way later. So uh, Vicente Cedarberg, Brian Vicente was running Sensible Colorado. And I mean, I was a high schooler uh, running in the streets with protest signs um, uh, ever since then. Um, and then, you know, started progressing and becoming more of a professional. I started working in legislation, policy. Um, I started going to the meetings. I started going to our state capitol. I mean, I've probably donated three to 400 hours of my time um, making sure that this was going to become acceptable for people to engage in, uh, in Colorado. But uh, well, you it know, was- I remember, Well, Colorado, you know, I had an office in Colorado in downtown Denver. Um, back when Roy Romer was your governor. And I also hosted one of the first, the mayor, uh, the, yeah, the mayoral um, election. I think it was 2002, 2000, no, it was been 2004. I literally hosted uh, the segment of the debate on cannabis there in downtown Denver. Um, back when Norm Early was your district attorney and and I was a uh, very, very interesting. I, I, I spent a lot of time in Colorado. I had an office there, and then I ended up moving my office to California when I started my show. But um, yeah, Colorado was was you know like California, one of the leaders. So so th- this is 2006 for you. You were um, out protesting in the streets, and then you decided when you went to college. You went to college, of course, in Colorado, and then after graduating, is that when you decided to open up and found? Uh, Tricom Institute. It was it was during college when I was tired of the misinformation um, being that wasn't helping people in, in the cannabis industry. You know the idea these plants are, are this strain name. <laughs> it's not. I, I did a video uh, got on YouTube where I went secret shopping for Blue Dream in Denver, Colorado, and I got six different types of flowers, all called Blue Dream. Uh, from licensed legal dispensaries for medical patients in in under one hour. And and we demonstrate how and why the plant types are different from each other and why the black market ideology is so problematic. And today, why the current lab testing is not helpful, Um, which we can definitely get into if if, if you want to. Um, But it it was around college that I started working in the dispensaries and I started caring for patients. And I started to really see that this industry is, is happening but it's not going to happen well if we keep the black market ideology moving forward. And, and the cannabis industry today has really embraced uh, the kind of stuff that I would experience in people's mom's basements, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like blue dream, dude, 32% THC. And it's like, it's, it's not about that. Um, it's, it's more complex than that. And getting into that complexity is really where the magic is. That's, that's where cannabis, you can really start to take control of your cannabis. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially, you know, and then those who are seeking to, you know, uh, find relief for whatever their individual ailments may be, um, you know, if they were to know more about the plant this way, they could make better decisions when they're out going in and navigating some of these dispensaries around this country. And it's only getting worse. It's not getting better. But that's the thing that really shocks me is that, you know, as new states come on, online, the new states practice the same bad propaganda that was taught 15 years ago, thinking that they found something new. Well, we're, we actually have some unbelievable, uh, very expensive, sophisticated technologies that were excited to come out with to combat this uh this this bs that you and i are talking about right now we're um developing uh we're partnering with some really incredible industry members with some technologies that are mind-blowing uh to combat a lot of the problems that the cannabis industry is moving forward with that you're talking about which is strain names uh basic coas and and thc percentages and this is all really terpene dependent and so you were discussing that we were just scratching the surface of, you know, cannabinoids, uh, which is true. But, um, you know, the typically the highest terpene count that is provided is around 42 terpene types. The guys that we're working with built a terpene supercomputer where they can actually analyze the aromatics, which have an effect type on you in a three-dimensional gas chromatography process. So we're actually looking at the smell of cannabis and the totality of it uh, three-dimensionally and in color 
uh, to, and they're reading over 400 terpene types in some singular samples of cannabis. And so with our ability to actually see and feel and smell the chemistry that is actually there, we can reverse engineer how cannabis works. We can grade it uh, with our human self, not a machine in a lab process. And we can develop apps that say, hey, you've got MS, awesome. Uh, what, kind, what cannabis works good for you and your MS? What type of variety of cannabis from an effect type perspective? And, and, and we will help teach you about that on this application too. But at the end of the day, most apps that will show you where cannabis is, is based on strain names or basic COA lab testing, which are not really accurate. And so we care enough about cannabis to move forward with some really uh, complex work in the background so that people in the foreground don't have to think about it. <laughs> All right. you have to do is pull out your cell phone, scan a jar of cannabis, and then look and see, oh, out of the five effect types, this is going to be the most stimulating or slightly stimulating or in between or slightly sedative or the most sedative. You know, cannabis is not indica or sativa. It's neither of those two. It's all domesticated hybrid plant types between a narrow leaf, broad leaf spectrum, between a stimulating to sedative spectrum. Um, and, and that's only marijuana. Then we get into hemp <laughs> and right. now a whole new ball game, which is cannabis. Um, and so uh, we're actually starting to offer hemp uh, as the Tricom Institute to teach people how to gauge their cannabis quality because we teach people how to dissect their flower um, to see if it's even ripe. Your lab test won't tell you if it's ripe. Your lab test doesn't tell you if there's bugs on it or not. And get this, uh, legislatively mandated lab testing that looks for microbials, looks for the types of microbes that are on food, such as salmonella um, and E. coli, and they do not look for the molds that are common for cannabis, such as petritus cinerea or powdery mildew. It's like, we're done. <laughs> we're done with the industry. Like, just It's all the government guys who think they know how to do it better than the guys who have been growing the ganja, like two or three generations, it's like, we, we've got to make a bridge and we're going to be technical. We're going to be scientific, but we got to dig deeper. We got to, th this plant is too dynamic and offers too much to only be testing for a couple cannabinoids and, and maybe a dozen or two terpenes. Absolutely. And I, I agree with you one million percent, but unfortunately we are in an industry where, you know, again, we circ for we, I say this industry, you know, um, pays more attention to B to B than they do B to C. Meaning, you know, we're too busy trying to make sure we stay one step ahead of our competition, rather than enlightening our consumer to let them know what they should be looking for. And that alone would keep you ahead of the competition if you were able to do that. It's what we're doing. <laughs> we All actually. Right. Yeah. We don't care too much about what other businesses and companies are doing because that's their business. And um, we care about people. We care about the plant. We care about education. But, but unfortunately, unfortunately, you're going to have to get some of those other businesses on board so that they stop putting out the false information so that people will even be readily, you know, uh, uh, optimistic about hearing from you. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean, and we're actually going to give those businesses who want to do cannabis the right way an opportunity in a technology to uh, differentiate themselves from the rest of their competitors mm -hmm. by actually, instead of saying indica or sativa, uh, using different terminology that's a little bit more accurate, but in a little bit more of a simple way, too. Um, it's, it's complex to understand from the background, but the point is, is we understand that problem that you're talking about. We are working on it. And when the technology is available, how could, how could the industry not embrace pointing people in a better direction to the cannabis that they're looking for and how it's going to affect them more accurately? Um, it's only a matter of time. Well, you know, then, then think about that since if you've got like your slight crystal ball on, but when you say it's only a matter of time, you take a look at what's going on nationally. I mean, we look back at November 6th, you know, cannabis won. Um, forget about who won the presidential election, cannabis won. 
five new states, you know, passing or five, five states passing new legislation. Yet since the date, there has been as much pushback in those same number of states as there has been the people who have been sharing the fact that it was passed. Look at the South Dakota, where they're trying to now write legislation to undo the will of the people. Look at New Jersey, where they've tried their best to slow down the process of even answering and, you know, uh, standing up for what the people voted for. So I, I find it, it's it's almost like, you know, again, you know, we're living in a time where we've got a president, a brand new president who says, we're going to follow the science, but this brand new president is still living off of science from 30 years ago. Cannabis is a gateway drug. Shut, you know what I mean? I want to say, shut the, you know what up. And we got a vice president who, you know, during her tenure as, uh, you know, uh, AG made sure that there were as many people, more people of color arrested during her four years than, than previously and, and after. So, you know, um, we take two steps forward to take 10 steps back. And if you had to use your crystal ball, how many more years of steps do we have to take before we finally reach, you know, an understanding that there's nothing wrong with this plant? You know, what's funny is um, I'm actually the centerfold in a penthouse magazine um, for my cannabis crystal ball because I've been predicting the cannabis future for 10 years. And nothing that I've predicted has ever failed. It's really crazy. There's so we have an article of me predicting the future um, that came out a couple of years ago, and everything that I said has slowly become real, which is um, both good, positive, and negative. Um, so from like a negative perspective, I predicted, and I'm telling you, you're going to see less and less belly style, meaning your human ability to go to a dispensary and see the flower and smell it and decide that that's what's right for you, the way that you do with your fruits and your vegetables or any of your other groceries is going to go away. And that happened. Um, I also predicted that medical marijuana dispensaries will become illegal. Uh, and slowly but surely that's happening. So, you know, Washington State had an incredible medical marijuana program, gone. Now it's retail cannabis. And that state took away people's ability to engage their flower and see if it was right for them. Now it's all prepackaged. And now California just went that way. And so that's why these technologies that we're building that are going to tell you how cannabis will affect you um, in a really, really dynamic way and be able to grade it for people from a quality perspective, from a cannabis sommelier perspective, interpreting methodology is going to become more and more important as medical marijuana will be going away more as it will start to transfer more into pharmaceuticals. Now you see epidiolex, which is phytocannabidiol, which is pharmaceutical, even though it's still a schedule one drug, meaning cannabis doesn't provide a medical benefit. So you are still being lied to by your federal government and people are still being thrown in jail because of it. And nothing about that is cool, but Texas, has medical marijuana dispensaries. They have an incredible hemp industry. The Tricom Institute just judged can, uh, Texas's very first cannabis competition ever, just a couple months ago. Um, I can't believe that Virginia is not only medicalizing, um, people that I know there have medical marijuana cards. They're buying legitimate cannabis from Virginia, but now Virginia is going legal. I can't believe Oklahoma uh, just next door, not only has a medical industry, but it's prolific. Um, the, the domino effect is happening. Um, and if states are smart, what they'll do is they'll look at the Colorado statistics of, okay, how many people are getting hurt versus how much crime is going down because of cannabis? How much uh, opiate use is going down because of cannabis? Wherever dispensaries pop up, Crime and opiate use decline. You can just see it statistically. And then what about jobs? What about revenue? What about taxes? I mean, we're building hospitals and schools out of a hundred million extra dollars a year from our cannabis industry. We're helping society, whether that society likes it or not. And we're really proud of that. I mean, we, you, 
This is a we, we we as an industry, so we're really proud of it. We as an industry are proud of that. However, there seems to now be this pushback afoot, just like there's pushback against global warming. There's pushback afoot. Look at here in Florida. Here in Florida, where I'm coming to you from, you know, they are trying their best to enforce a cap, um, an arbitrary cap on the amount of THC because they're trying not to hurt or help the patient. They're trying to hurt the industry by forcing you to have to buy much more thinking that you need more because of the numbers. And I can, I, I've often said this and I talked about it yesterday on a podcast. And I remember, you know, in the early seventies and the, you know, late sixties and early seventies, I don't think you could probably have found back then, you know, a, a cannabis plant that had, you know, a higher percentage than 11% THC. And it was fairly, it was really good cannabis. As a matter of fact, I can remember some experiences with that in my younger years where, you know, I think I've never found anything to quite match it even till the day. So, but, but the fact that you've got, you know, uh, this arbitrary number that, you know, the state of Florida wants to come up with to cap the amount of THC, they want to try to roll back some of the dispensaries that are providing cannabis. I remember when they first passed down there, they wanted you to only be able to, to, uh, uh, use cannabis, um, by using it in a suppository way. So you have all of these strain, which is okay, which, but at the same time, you know, it's not the only way that it can be effective. So, you know, I, again, I still think we take three steps, two steps forward and 10 steps back, but go ahead. Um, the war on drugs, as you know, Montel is a war on people. Absolutely. We, the people are the ones responsible for fighting back. And uh, some of us warriors are infantry. Some of us are gunners. And, you know, some of us are the stealth bomber pilots. And we're dropping bombs, dude. We're not giving up. We're fighting this fight. And we're winning. Because at the end of the day, more and more states are opening up. And, of course, there's going to be confusion. Of course, there's going to be battles. Of course, there's going to be soccer moms who think the sky is going to fall out uh, when a dispensary opens up, you know, down the street. And, of course, they're going to combat it. And, of course, it's still going to be a fight. And, of course, we're still fighting it. But we are winning more two steps than it is one step back. Um, right. It is a matter of time. It's moving forward more than it's not. Um, and so are psychedelics. I mean, right. Colorado, you, you have legal uh, MDMA that is pharmaceutically produced by the FDA for the PTSD trials coming out of MAPS. In Colorado, you can legally engage in ayahuasca and peyote with certain license types. We just, we were the first city to decriminalize psilocybin mushrooms, um, as well as cannabis. And you're starting to see that in other places, New Jersey, um, Santa Cruz, uh, all of Oregon, <laughs> just most recently. Um, we the people are fighting, Montel, and we're not giving up, and we're winning. Well, you know, I'm from your mouth to God's ears because uh, at the same time that you say we're winning, we still see a lot of arrest, especially of people of color who are losing. Uh, when you look at this industry across the board, we look at an industry that was born on the backs of people of color. 80% of the arrests since 1937 were against people of color. And when you take a look at the industry that has less than 1% people of color being invited to the table, yeah, you know, winning is, is all in the eye of the beholder. Um, but you know, I think you're right. At least we are taking, I, again, I, I feel like until we can, you know, again, look, we, we just, we got a new administration in. They've been there now for three months. One of the things that they kept saying near the end of their campaign was that this would be addressed in the first 100 days. Well, 100 days is almost over. And they haven't addressed it. And are they afraid to because they think it just might be that one thing that sets off the same people who were busting into the Capitol? You know, there's conversations being held and news reports about the fact that the Capitol reeked of cannabis. Hmm. You know what? Did you see the did you see that one? Uh, I guess you could call him insurrectionist who uh, in the dome of the Capitol lit one up this big and just was puffing it real tough. Yep. And I think what that goes to show you is one of my favorite things about cannabis, which is it is for everyone. And so from your Snoop Dogg to your uh, Willie Nelson, 
from your liberal to your conservative, from your black to your white, from your rich to your poor, people who understand cannabis, who have taken the time to learn about it and overcome the misinformation, embrace it. And as Richard Nixon was so terrified of, it does bring people together. And you're 100% right. I mean, this I studied cannabis as a sociologist. It was the only thing I studied in school as a sociologist, kind of my protest for having to go to school. Um, but I mean, as a sociologist studying campus, I researched relentlessly how and why people of color are arrested at three times the rate. It's, it's unfair and it's true. And it's also true that the cannabis industry doesn't have a whole lot of people of color in it. Um, and that's not okay. Uh, it's also why we've done anything and everything we can to supply a lot of our education and certification that helps get people jobs um, into some programs so that uh, certain people have uh, easier access to it. We care about that. We want to we want to uplift the, that that community too. Um, it's it's a war on people, and if we the people don't come together and fight it together, let's just say we need to, uh, and, and do more. And anything we can do to support that, we're we're all in. Well, I can tell you, Max, thanks so much for being a part of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. I tell you, we definitely have to have you back because I want to have, you know, some more discussions with you, especially about some of the other plants that you are doing research on, right? Why don't you explain some of that? You're doing some research on, again, you went through a psilocybin, ayahuasca, uh, a lot of the psychedelics where a lot of people now are in a lot of, you know, mainstream medicine is starting to recognize its efficacious. Yep, absolutely. Well, I'd love to be back. Um, yeah, let's talk about peyote and ayahuasca next time and uh, in hemp and how awesome hemp is, especially as a medical cannabis product. Um, but I really appreciate being blunt with you, Montel, and I appreciate being on your show. So um, I'd love to be back and, uh, and chat more. So thank you so much. Absolutely. We will definitely have you back. And I want to make sure you guys make sure you tune in and make sure you wait because I'm telling you, uh, you've been schooling us well, Max. And thank you so much for all the hard work you've done. And, um, you know, anything we can do here, you always have a home here. And I thank you. So make sure you guys also tune into the next version of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments. Thank you.